Hey everybody, Lars here. Time for the very last video we're going to have for Python methodologies for data science. There's only one review video that I do for Unit 6 because, as I've said, Unit 6 is kind of a survey. It's more exposure to some of these concepts than really digging in and working with them. I mean, I hope you have the time to take some of the code that you do in the slides. Like I know we talk about data structure called stacks and we actually do a pretty popular computer science problem when you first learn about stacks you uh, take postfix numbers and, and solve equations with them and we do this with stacks so take a look at that code and run it if you'd like you know I want if you want to get involved with it Google it go to Wikipedia look up all these things play around with some code it's similar to when you learn statistics you will sit there and the first time you have to do confidence intervals, you will do all the math yourself and add things up and boom, 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 and do it. And then when you're done, someone will look at you and say, hey, you never have to do that again. Now you can use R or SPSS or SAS or whatever. Well, it's the same thing with a lot of these data structures. Uh, when you take that second class, when you go to university for a computer science education, it's data structures and you learn about stacks and queues and binary trees and hash tables and dictionaries, associative arrays, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> link lists and such and you code them up yourself and you get them working and you understand the the inner parts of them and how they're working and then when you're done we computer science educators laugh and say okay you never have to do that again because all of these structures are in libraries I uh, back a oh, thousand years ago when we used uh, C++ or C, we had a template library. And there is a library in Java called Collections. And there is a library in Python called Collections. And you'll learn about lists and sets and dead stacks and queues. And you're going to learn about DQ. And you're going to learn about all these things in this unit. So you learn a little bit about data structures. And then you find out, hey, they're already written for you. So you can just go grab them and use them like, you know, so many tools in your toolbox now. Seems, I mean, the summer went by and so fast with this class, but you're Python programmers now. It's pretty cool, right? It's only what? Today's the fourth, so it's only really been two months. We started day after Memorial Day. What was that? The 31st or the 30th? So all the month of June, all the month of July. Two months. Went quick, right? All right. Um, I am up against it because I had to produce a bunch of reports about my lab and I had to do some other things and tomorrow morning I have to drive to Lake Wallenpawpuk to see some old college friends and do some things up in the Poconos and I don't know when I'm going to get back so I'm scared that you won't have a review video to look at until Monday or Tuesday so what I decided to do it's I don't know you, you can see my clock is 20 after 11 at night as I went back and I grabbed an old lecture I grabbed an old lecture from 2016 it's a good one though um, that's going to go over all the data structure stuff so you watch that and then come back afterwards, we'll do a couple announcements, and then that's going to be it. Um, you know, I'll save the dates for the announcements, but we're, you know, we're a week, week and a half away, and we're going to be done. All right? It was a good class. So, you watch this lecture on data structures, and I'll be back after the lecture ends. All right? All right. See you soon. Basically, what we're going to do today is we're just going to go over the four basic data structures that I review in Unit 6, but... We're going to glance over stacks and queues, then we're going to concentrate on linked lists, then we're going to glance over binary trees. I don't even think we're going to look at any code for binary trees. Because like I always say, I want you to be aware of this stuff, and I want you to be exposed to the concepts, and I want you to be exposed to the terminology, but I don't want you to spend a month working with these things because, frankly, we don't have the time. I mean, we have – you have been exposed to – Imperative Python, object-oriented Python, now you're getting data structures, you've seen data science concepts along the way. It's, and it's only been, you know, it's only 15 weeks. There's only so much we can do. So I do want you to see these data structures. And like I told you, if we were in that class, we, the uh, companies are interested in, in making sure that, that when people come bouncing out of an analytic master's program, business of science, they do know a little something about data structures and they do know something about linked lists so we'll concentrate on that all right but first let's look at stacks and queues i think i have the ludum dare i will tell you about that later that's going on right now that's actually a game jam but we will deal with it later i could just leave this up stacks and queues a stack as a data structure stores our data just like a pez dispenser does okay 
what we do is when we have something we want to save, we push it to the top of the stack. So as you can see, all those items going in in this drawing here, we're putting a 31 in the stack. So then when we pop the stack, the first thing out will be the 31. Okay, last in, first out, just like it says down here. So if you wanted to get that A out, you'd have to pop the B, pop the 12, pop the 3, and then you would finally be able to get access to that A. This, in a computer science concept context, if you think about it, is just memory. It's remembering what I did before. What did I do before that? Okay, what did I do before that? And it's kind of a way when we do tasks in computer science, it's, okay, I'm doing something. Well, let me go look if I need to do this. Oh, I do push this stuff to the stack, go do what I have to handle. Then when I come back, I pop the stack and my old task is right there for me to do. Stacks are like ways computer scientists in the 50s and 60s and 70s dealt with memory, with remembering what I was doing the second before I was doing it, okay? Which differs ever so slightly with the next thing we are going to look at, cues. A cue is less about memory and more about scheduling because a cue, it, you, do an, you don't do a push and a pop with a cue, you do an insert and a delete. And when you use a cue, you use first in, first out. So it maintains the order of which things entered the system. And if you think temporally, things enter the system either before you or after you. So by using a queue, you kind of maintain order. And it's a good thing for scheduling purposes. I know what's in front of me. I know what was in back of me. And if you want to do scheduling, like what we do with uh, Operating systems, if you write operating system code, you have jobs, and those jobs have to be scheduled, and they have different priorities. So what you do is you put those jobs in a queue, and if they all have the same priority, then you run them in a row. What came in first, then run that. What came in second, then run that. So a queue is a, a data structure that's kind of used for scheduling purposes, to know what came in and what came before. I... I'm going to run some code, though. I think i got some code waiting for us. I do. Stacks.py is, of course, going to be up on Sakai when I'm done with this. Uh, let's run this bad boy. All right. And let me put all this right next to each other so we can see it. So two considerations when we look at data structures and we're using Python. Number one. Because of lovely unit five, we are now all aware of object orientation. So a lot of object oriented techniques lend themselves to data structures because what do you have? You have the data, the actual place where everything is, and then you have methods and ways that you can use that data. Doing a stack is a perfect example of that. We're going to use a list because it turns out a list is a data structure and a stack is kind of like a list. So when we want to add something to the stack, what do we do? We do an append, okay? Now the second, an append is just a method. That's where I'm going with that, is that the object orientation is uh, rather convenient. I actually have my leg out of the boot and out open in the air, and it is itching me to no end. Hopefully I won't be leaning over and scratching it too much during this video. I digress. All right. Object orientation is important when we're thinking about these things. But the second thing is that we've got Python. Python is made for computer programmers. Python is made to be readable. Python is made to be easy to use. So all of these data structures that we're going to run into, they're already written. They're already sitting there. There's a library called Collections. And a lot of these data structures that we're going to talk about later, binary trees, linked lists, blah, 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 there's code for it made already. Okay? What we're going to do to, to use a stack, to implement a stack, is we're just going to grab a list. And for our push, we're going to use append. And for our pop, we're going to use pop. Stack has a method called pop, okay, which takes from the end of the list where the, the object was inserted. So it acts just like that Pez dispenser. The last thing in is going to be the first thing back out. And we're going to see, and we see that behavior when we run it. Look, I get it. Stack one, I'm going to grab a list. Stack one, append test. So test is in there. Stack two, append. I'll even draw it. Look at, I'm even going to give you some, some added drawing stuff here. All right. Stack one, append, test. So, test. Ho, 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 ho. Not that good writing with the mouse. So, test gets put in our list. Stack two, append two. What gets put on top of it? 
two. Oh, that's a weird two. Stack one, a pen, test two. What gets put on top of the stack? Test two. All righty, Rudy. 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 Wow, that's bad. Okay, so append, test, append, two, put it on top of it. We're dealing with a stack. Stack two, test two, boom. So now we print our first look at stacks up here. You see it right here. And now we pop the stack. What's on top of the stack? Okay. Last thing in was the first one out. Oh, I'm scratching the leg again. That's two. That's two times I'm going down for a scratch. Oh, my goodness gracious. I should get a, a scratcher so I can just do it from up here. What do we see? Test two. All right. That was popped, so it's off the stack. We do it again. Stack one, pop. What do we get? Two. Just like here. We stack it. Now, if we were to look at that stack and we don't, we would see test as the last thing there. We can do whatever we want, though, so. Now, if we rerun it, we pop that test right out of there. So we pop the last thing right out, okay? Whereas if we use queues, now queues are a different beastie. When I do queues in Python, I import a class called DQ and I get a DQ object, okay? And then I use it as my queue. If you go online, I'm not gonna go crazy about it, but if you go look at collections and you go look at DQ, you'll see that's what you wanna use if you use a queue. So what do I do? I add test. <laughs> that's bad. Then I add my two. Then I add test two. So now, because it's the method that we use with DQ, instead of a pop, I use what's called a pop left, okay? So I'm going to go grab a data item from the other end of where I would grab it if I used a pop when I use pop left. Because this is a Q, what are we going to get when we do a pop left? We're going to get test. We're going to get the first thing we put in. And as you can see, it's what we get right here. Now we look at Q's test. Pop left again. We get the two because it's in the middle. We did that last pop left, we'd see test two. Because I'm crazy like that, we're going to do it. Oh, cute. Oh. Run that baby again. Look, test two. So that was out there. All right? So do not shave that. So that's how we're using stacks and cues. A stack is a Pez dispenser. The last thing we put in is the first thing that's coming out of that bad boy. We use it for memory and remembering, okay? Cues for scheduling. It remembers order in a temporal sense, what came before me, what came after me, okay? The first thing I put in, test, is going to be the first thing that comes out, FIFO. LIFO, FIFO, okay? So th those are the simplest data structures that there are always, like I've said before, you go to university for computer science education. First thing you're going to get is intro, some simple topics, some analysis, algorithms, sorting and searching, recursion. You'll learn your first language. It's a lot of stuff, actually. Um, second course is always data structures. I used to, when I was a kid, it was the weed out. If you couldn't hack data structures, then you weren't going to be a computer scientist. Um, and that's almost... Always you start with stacks and queues. That's an easy way to ease people into the idea of, oh, okay, there's different ways we can organize our data. And when we organize our data in these certain ways, then there are time-tested algorithms that we use. In your slides, I'm not going to do it here, you see how I show you how you can do equations with Polish notation and use stacks to separate the operators and the operands and actually create a little calculator that does, you know, calculations for you. There's different algorithms and things like that for stacks, queues, for all of these data structures. All right? So that's pretty much the skinny on stacks and queues. I'm going to keep moving because this is going to be a long video if I don't get my rear end in gear. I am going to put stacks.py up for you in your resources. Now, I think what I want to do next is I want to go grab... A drawing surface again. Let me grab red ink. Um, and we are going to talk about 
the third data structure we want to talk about in this video, linked lists. This is the story. Uh, first thing we're going to do, I guess, is that a linked list introduces the concept of something called a node. And a node is where your data isn't just one single entity anymore. Your data is inside of a package that carries it. And this package comes with extra information almost in, in metadata. In the case of a linked list, you would have a node and it would have two sections to it, okay? You would have what's called your payload or your data in one part of the node. And then in the second part of the node, you would have something called a pointer. And the pointer, all it does is it points to the next item in your list. So this, I'm just going to do the end. I'm not going to do the whole word. This is a node, okay? So this is the story. Back in the day, you had a list. We call them arrays. And if you wanted to store your data, you would have your array and you say, I have a two. Okay, I'm going to put two in the zero spot. And then I have a three. Okay, I'm putting three in the one spot. Okay, I have an eight. So I'm going to take an eight. There's a badly drawn eight and put it in the two spot and everything is good. And, and this is the way we're going to do our memory. There's a problem with this. And I'm going to take this away. Back in the old days, memory was scarce. It was not as plentiful as it is these days. So it was difficult sometimes to get a lot of different memory spaces. And it was especially difficult if you knew you needed a lot of memory, if you needed 2,000 spaces or 3,000 spaces. Uh, storing data the way that I just showed you is, is putting data in what we call contiguous memory, memory that is next to each other and right there waiting to use. Well, it turns out that there wasn't all there wasn't a lot of memory to use. And as computer programmers, people were looking for techniques and ways to utilize all of the memory that was out there. So one of the ways people handled memory management was with these linked lists, because linked lists don't require your data to be contiguous. Let's say I have a, a node here. I have a node here. OK, and it could be anywhere in memory. I'm going to do one more. I'm going to put one more right here. And these D's just mean data for payloads. OK, all right. Let's say I have the top portion of my link list right here. That's usually called a head. We're going to draw it a little better next time. And let's say it points to here. So now this is the second item in my link list. OK, and then let's say this one points here. So that's the third item in my list. Then this one points here. Okay. So now I have four items in a list and they're not next to each other in physical memory, but logically they're next to each other because I had data. Then I said where to go to get the next one. Data, where to go to get the next item. Data, where to go to get the next item. So if I want to add to this list, it's real easy. I can go get a memory location anywhere. OK, it could be anywhere in memory that I get a new location. And all I do is I go to my last node in the list and I make it point to this. And now I have increased my linked list by one. OK, it's that simple. And because the data doesn't have to be contiguous, I don't have to tell the program beforehand how many spaces I use. So I don't have to allocate that memory. I can do it on the fly. This was called dynamic memory allocation and by utilizing linked lists we could do dynamic memory allocation oh i ran into a spot where i need some memory well now i can automatically go get it okay as you can probably imagine from looking at this drawing it's easy to delete something if i want to say delete this item right here what's currently the third item all i have to do is break this link okay and have this item now point to this one all right. You're never going to look at this now. That's dead out in space. Don't get me started. I'm talking about garbage collection with C++ and Java. Um, but this guy's out in space right now. First item up here on top points to the second item. Second item right here now points to this item. So in essence, you've deleted this. Okay. Now let's say I want to insert an item. 
Let's say I have a new item and I want to insert it in between the first two. Well, what I do is I break this and I take this and I point it at this and I take this and point it at this. Done. So now th this is no longer used. <clears throat> I go from the first one down to this one. Let's give it some data. <coughs> then up to this one. That's been deleted. So now I go down to this one and then down to this one. So that's the content. Look how that looks like a child drew it. <laughs> that looks like a little kid drew that drawing. <laughs> so that is the basic concept of a linked list. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to start from scratch. Watch me work. Don't save. Oh, <laughs> so from a programming standpoint, with object orientation, we want to do two things. We want to get two objects here, and I'll show you the code in a second. And it's the code you're going to work with for your homework, and you're going to see your homework's easy because I'm giving you the code. All you have to do is really augment it and then add a little bit of functionality. And if you can understand what's going on here, it'll be easy to do that. All right, you got your little node, okay, but this is just a node. Let's have a data structure called a linked list, and it's going to handle two things. It's going to, one, it's always going to know where the first node is, and that's called the head. So we're going to make sure it knows the location of the head. And the second thing we're going to do is we're always going to know how big we are. Okay? We're always going to know the size. So when we have a data object, the head is going to point to a node. I want to say it's right here. Boom. Okay? It's going to point to that node. And then this node is going to point to another node. And then this node is going to point to another node. And every time we add a node, we click one to size. So we'll do a plus equals one to our size so we can keep track of it. And when we delete one, we would decrement from that and boom, boom, boom. And that's basically the way we're going to handle a linked list. Enough of this drawing. Although we'll be back because I'm going to do some data structure stuff. I am going to, where's my linked list? Right here. Look at this piece of cake. That is just a simple class for a linked list. I have two. Um, oh, I was going to say where <laughs> I thought I had two classes here. Indeed, I do. One is the node and one is the linked list. And as you can see, the node doesn't have any methods. It just sets up two points. It has your payload and it has your pointer. But here your pointer just points to a variable. OK. I'm not even going to get into it, but if we were using C or some other languages, you would have an actual memory location in there. But for our purposes, showing you things with Python, I'm just going to point using a variable name. But when you, you know, when you use C or you use assembly, you use real memory locations and you get down to the nitty gritty. You tell it exactly where to go while you're running your program. So the node really has all those two things we talked about, the payload and then pointing to the next item. Then in the class linked list, what do we do? We set up our linked list, we have our head, we have our size, and then we have a method called insert, okay? If it's not the head, we make it the head. It's kind of like we're pushing things down the line with our linked list here. We're not attaching it to the end. We're making it the first item because you can see self.head. We're going to use the node that we accepted here, okay? And you're going to see that when, we, when I run the code. And then I'm going to add one to size, done, okay? Now, Else, if it is the head, we do something else. But don't worry about that for now. Get size, I just return a variable. So I'll always know how big my list is, okay? And then I put in a real quick uh, method to print the list, okay? So I just make the node equal to self.head, and while my node, I just go down the line and print the next node, print the next node, print the next node, okay? So when I run this code, nothing happens. Uh-oh, nothing happens. Why? Why? Because it's a library, I have another piece of code here called use ll here. Actually, let me put this here, uh, this here, and this over here so we can see it all. All right. I have a thing called use link list over here. So I grab the link list and I import it all. And I grab one. I put it in something called my list. And then I use the insert and I start putting names in there. These are names of kids from the place where I used to teach. Uh, enrichment students who were in seventh and eighth grade in New Brunswick. Good kids. Uh, you'll see I, I make a node of the payload Lars and then I insert it in the list. So just like here, I'm giving it a node because that's what it wants. How does it know what a node is? Because it's right here. It's defined. Okay. Um, I do the same here with Alex. 
Then I run get size. What does get size does? It just returns self dot size. So now if I run this, you see two, three, Abby, Michael, Alex, Lars. So let's take a look at that. Uh, well, actually, let's look at the code to look at that. What am I doing here? I'm inserting Lars. I'm inserting Alex. Then I'm doing a get size. Get size returns two because I've only got two things in there. I insert Michael. I do a get size. Now there's three things in there. See? Then I use my print method. Print the linked list. What do I print? Abby, Michael, Alex, Lars. You see the order in which it prints it? It looks backwards because it's taking this and it's making it the head of the list. So it's basically pushing it down, pushing it down. It's almost like sort of like a stack behavior in our linked list, which is fine. I mean, if you think about it, the stacks that we're doing are lists, but there's nothing saying that you can't implement a stack on top of a linked list. Oh, boy, that's confusing. I don't want to confuse you. But there's nothing stopping us from doing that. So technically, the second thing in the linked list is Michael. Because Obby's the head now. Obby's the last thing we put in. Obby's the head. Second thing is Michael. Third thing is Alex. Fourth thing is Lars. Okay? That's going to come in, put in handy for you because I am going to give you a homework assignment where you're going to have to print. I think you're going to have to print the second thing or the third thing or something like that. I forget. But I'm not going to do your homework for you. But I mean, what if I just did this? Just to be a joker. Every time I go through, nothing happens because it is a library. What if I came here and re-ran it? Oh, look at that. Hmm, interesting. So now I print one, two, three, four. I print it down the line. Okay? That might come in handy. Hmm? I'll even leave that there. Did I save it? Yes, it did. And I'll put linked list. And use LL, which is use link list, up in your resources for you. You're going to have this code. I'm giving you this code. So you'll have a link list to use and play with and, and play with the code and to see how it works, okay? And then when you do your homework, I, I do believe the homework is just going to be find the second item and print the second item. And I think you might be able to do that by looking at this. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Uh, I can't remember. I think the extra credit assignment is to use another data structure in order to print the linked list backwards. So think on that one. If you read the slides and look at this video and think about things clearly in your head, you should be able to do it in three minutes. All right? But it's for extra credit, and if it's breaking your brain, then don't worry about it. All right? All right, so that's linked list. I'm putting all this up on resources for you. You're going to be good to go when you have that. Uh, the last thing we're going to talk about, and I'm not even going to do any code with it, is binary trees. Now, you already are familiar with the concept of a node now because we are experts with linked lists. But you've got to remember, this that's not the only kind of node there is. There is another kind of node node of a binary tree and that node has the payload in the middle and then on the left side you have a pointer and on the right side you have a pointer and on either side of these they're called leaves and they point to another node data boom boom and they point to other nodes okay you see what's going on here? So classically, when we see a binary tree structure drawn, we see something like this, where each of these little dots is a node in the binary tree. All right, and sometimes we have leaves on the right, and sometimes we have leaves on the left, and sometimes we only have them on the right, and sometimes we have both, and sometimes they have none, and sometimes they're broken, sometimes you have things called degenerate binary trees. It's a bazillion different ways. And if you think about the slides, there's different ways to traverse this binary tree. There's different ways to store data in it. Um, but that's basically what's going on, what I have here. Uh, let me do that. Pointer out. Pointer out. So, and data. So basically, if I were to draw that, it would just be that. Okay? That's a binary tree. 
And you might be thinking to yourself, why in the name of heaven am I going to drive myself insane and store my data in some crazy middle level construct like that that's probably just going to get in the way and be confusing and I'll have to remember it and boom, boom, boom. Think about things this way. Up top here, I've got a node, right? And it goes down to a left leaf and it goes down to a right leaf. And technically, that's the smallest thing that can be considered a binary tree, right? This node right here, what does it have coming off of it? Another binary tree. What does this having come off of it? Another binary tree. Binary tree to a binary tree to a binary tree. You kind of get what I'm going for here? Binary trees lend themselves to being attacked with recursion, okay? What do I have? Do I have a, le a right leaf? Yes. Do I have a right leaf? Yes. Then do, do the same thing again. Right leaf? Yes. Do the same thing again. Right leaf? Yes. Do the same thing again. Right leaf? No. Tail condition, okay? No, I don't have a right leaf anymore. Well, then let's go back up the stack and perform some operation. Do I have a left? Yes. Do it. Go back to the thing. Go up one. Do I have a left? No. Then go back up. Go back up, blah, blah. It lends itself to recursive operations. And as you get further along in computer science and start learning about the things that we do store in binary trees, we can do sorting with binary trees. You, you're familiar with binary search. But if you store your items in a tree in a certain way, you can easily search it using recursive uh, methods and things along those lines. Binary trees lend themselves to being attacked recursively. So a little bit beyond the scope of what we're trying to do here, just trying to get you some exposure, just trying to get you to have the very basic information about what binary trees are and, and the different things that we do with them. So we're not going to go into it, psycho, but if you want to, go right ahead. Google, Google, it, Google Python space binary trees to your heart's content, and you will learn about red black trees and AVL, and you will learn about... Things that will make your brain hurt, but the pain goes away. And afterwards, you got some pretty neat information in there. So you'll probably be in good shape, all right? So that is it for the data structures that we're going to look at in Unit 6. Uh, stacks, Pez dispensers, queues, line at the grocery store. Linked list, a way to have a list where our memory items aren't all in a row. One, go here. Two, go here. Three, go here. Four, go here. So we can dynamically allocate our memory, and we don't have to have it all in a row. And a binary tree is just a, a different node structure that has three different spots. Uh, I'm going to draw one last thing for you because I do want to make mention of it. Like when I have a binary tree node, I have data, and I have a pointer here, and I have a pointer here. Well, I could have the same node structure, okay, data, pointer here, and pointer here. But I don't have to do a binary tree with it. I could do what's called a doubly linked list. I could have the first pointer in the list be what's called null. And then I could have this point to this, and this will point to this, okay? So that is doubly linked. So let's say I have three items. Holy parallelogram, Batman. So that's a D. That's an a. That's going to be equal to null because it's the end of our list. I think that's going to be a – that might be a test question somewhere. So this points to this, and this points to this. Now, what's the difference in functionality than our regular singly linked list? Think about it. In the singly linked list, if I was at the third item and I wanted to get back to the first, I had no way to do it. I was out in space because I don't know where I came from. I'm, I remember, in a singly linked list, payload, where I'm going. That's all I know. I don't know where. There's nothing here telling me where I came from. Okay? I'm out in space. I can tell you where I want to go to get the next item, but that's it. All right? If I have a doubly linked list, I have the option of going backwards. <clears throat> hey, I'm in this spot. What's the thing that came before me? Bloop, I know, because I can go there. All right? That is the same node structure as a binary tree, because a binary tree, payload in the middle, two things, only they go down and they point to their branches. 
Okay, but that's you know that's the way we think of them in our minds. Technically, as far as the computer is concerned, same structure. Node has the same structure. All right, I digress. I don't want to get crazy and confuse your students. Okay, so that's it. Stacks, queues, linked lists, binary trees. Now you get a little bit of flavor, get a little bit of survey for what we're talking about when people say data structures. Now, you can go online and say data structure space Python and look in the collections library and learn all about sets and learn all about Q and DQ and stacks and all of the different data structures that there are for you to use in the future with your programs, hash tables. Um, associative arrays, dictionaries, all these things, they're just data structures. They're just ways that we store our data that we know certain algorithms work on. All right? All right, good. Testing, one, two, three. <laughs> all right, I'm back. Um, you should, I wish you could just see the stuff that you can't see. The boom mic and the crazy nonsense around here. Alexa, they can't see you. Uh, Alexa, tell me about the weather. In Matuchin, it's 75 degrees with clear skies. It's hot. Tonight, you can look for clouds with a low of 70 degrees. Thank you, Alexa. I couldn't think of shooting a video without everybody being able to hear you again. Just before when I ended the video, the the, Uru, the Thor's Uru hammer fell off the top of the bookshelf and hit me on the head. So that's either a good sign or a bad sign. I guess we'll figure out which in the next couple of days if I don't get in a car accident on the way to the Poconos. I guess I'm okay. I never know what's going on with the sound with this thing because this Yeti mic has been flashing in and out, in and out. I don't know whether it's it's sitting here on camera because I'm your right now or whether I try to back it off so you don't see it and it looks, you know, semi-natural. It's just an absolute train wreck. All right. My last digression. That's it. Those are the review videos. Those are the things that you need for data structures, stacks, queues, binary trees, linked lists, all together. It's a big party. It's a big computer science party. So remember those terms. Remember those things later on, especially if you move on to the, core, the Camden course, uh, data structures and algorithms. Those things are going to come in handy. Um, you're definitely going to get back and start working with a bunch of those data structures again. Okay. Announcements. What's left, right? Uh, unit six is going to end a week from this coming Sunday. So nine days from now, that's the day we'll have the quiz. But you know me, I'll open up the quiz probably that whole weekend for you. So you have time to do it. Um, <clears throat> drop dead date, final project, demo, um, code, August 15th. Because i got to get grades in the system, I think, by the 17th. I will, hopefully, maybe Sunday night, maybe Monday, if I need to be reminded, uh, we'll get you a, an example up on the web so you have something to look at, especially for the demo. Because some people are like, what, well, what does he expect? I just, if you do, if you can be a PowerPoint that's 30 slides long, it's too much. You did too much. I don't want to make you nuts. I don't want to make you crazy. I want you to take the Python you've learned and use it to do something that you want to do in a data science vein. That's all. That's all this is. So if you do a PowerPoint and it's 30 slides long and you do a YouTube video that's an hour and a half and there's a huge production and there's a 40-piece orchestra, you did too much. Okay? That said, don't just give me one slide. Here's my project. I like it. Look at it run. Da, 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 dee, 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 dee. That's no good either. So you know what I mean. You know, anywhere from 8 to 10 slides. Show it working. The word demonst what does the word demonstration mean? That's what I need to see. Some people will just show two pictures of the code running and say, well, our program worked great. <laughs> it's not a demonstration, which is why I kind of, I don't want to force people to have to do videos because some people don't have cameras or don't want to, you know, spend a bazillion hours learning the technology in order to do videos, boom, boom, boom. But we're starting to reach that day and age where you should really fast be able to do like a five minute makeshift how-to video to you know communicate with other people and show people how to do things that's just my take on it you know then again i'm the, the idiot sitting here with the camtasia making the python videos for a college course so you know i'm kind of preaching to the choir on that one but and eh, what are you gonna do all right 
I'm going to get out of here. This is your last review videos. You guys were a great class. Everything was always on time. Good, thoughtful questions. Good bunch. Well-attended classes. Can't say enough about you guys, especially for a summer. Because I know. I know. I, I used to be you. And I used to hate it when you took a summer course and it wasn't truncated. Because I gave you – I don't want you to get cheated. I gave you exactly what a 15-week – fall or spring semester class would have gotten. You got everything. If you talk with, with colleagues and, and fellow students who took the course during a regular semester, you're going to talk about the same things because you got, you got the course in all its glory, in all its naked glory. All right? All right, then I'm going to get out of here. Uh, you know me, Ansek High. I'm going to hit you with a bazillion dates up to the end. But basically, it's just Unit 6, one programming assignment, Simple course review for the forum post, um, one video to watch, and then you spend the time with your final projects. You'd be good to your group mates, and you get everything done on time, and then you enjoy the last couple of weeks of your summer. And then we get started again because September's almost here. All right? Then you guys be good. Thanks a lot for being a good class, and I'll talk to you soon. All right? If you ever need anything, biglars at cs.ruckers.edu, and you know... Once you're one of my students, you're always one of my students. So you're more than welcome at the cave anytime you want to come by. All right? Good. Then I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Did you hear that cat out there? That's a little bizarre. The cats start wailing when the video ends. That's not good. That's how horror movies start. All right. I'll get out of here. Yeah, bae.